Verina mai ke aloha i ako ako pākahi a pau, uh, mai o a o ka honua, e no kako ma Games for Change, e hala vaiana. Uh, aloha kako, greetings to all of you all over the world who are tuning in. Uh, we're here at Games for Change and we're at starting the Developing Indigenous Developers panel uh, very quickly. And this panel homes in on action-oriented communal voices who are um, engaging and activating relationships across generations and inviting people into the future driven by change and games. Yeah. And so very briefly, uh, I'm Kawila Mahi, who, and I'll be moderating today along with these fabulous and amazing panelists um, who will be introducing themselves. And so uh, if you could introduce yourself first, Kahandawak, uh, who you are and what you do for work. Yeah, so uh, hi everybody. My name is Gahanda Tuisha, and I come from Ganesadage, Quebec, which is a Mohawk territory inside of Canada in the province of Quebec. And uh, I'm currently working as the Skins Workshop Associate Director for Aboriginal Territories and Cyberspace and the Initiative for Indigenous Futures. And that's me. Amazing. And Alan, if you're ready to go. Uh, how? Um, Patu Vashte. Um, Alan Turner and Machiapi Yellow. Um, uh, hi, I'm Alan Turner. Good, good afternoon. And uh, so, yeah, I'm I'm Black Lakota Irish. I'm born and bred here in Chicago. And um, I teach game design here at DePaul University, where I'm at right now. Amazing. Mahalo, Alan. And um, Woody, if you're ready to introduce yourself. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Oti, and I am an indigenous Sami game researcher and uh, designer living in, in Finland. And um, I have been one of the organizers of um, Sami game jams, uh, for the first being in 2018, and the next one, hopefully, next year. Amazing. Um, and so one of the first questions that we're going to be going over um, is what waters connect you to your place? And this is a way to kind of get at who you are and understand on a deeper level, what is, how does it relate to the work you do? So if you could introduce um, a water that connects you to place, it could be a river, it could be a rain, it could be the snow, it could be any kind of water, body of water, yeah, or ocean. Um, and Alan, would you like to go first this time? So sure. Um, so being you know a Chicago, Chicago resident for all my life, um, obviously Lake Michigan is the hugest water influence on my life. Um, it's something that I return to pretty much on a daily basis. Actually, um, I have my 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 sunset walks along the lake, um, and those are those are my calming spaces because I have the the motion of the waters to my um, to my right or to my left. Um, there's like these little rebuilt prairie spaces um, that are all around it. So I'll get you know wind moving through the, um, um, the the high grasses and whatnot there, and then I'll get the motion of the uh, the sky above me, and that provides to me kind of a cleansing and washing, and it helps me to to, to recenter and stay in motion. Mahalo, thank you, Alan. Uh, Odi, would you be willing to go next? Yeah, um, my river is uh, Teno or Deatno uh, between um, Finland and Norway. And uh, my family uh, is salmon fisher, so I have an um, uh, ongoing bond to the river. That's my special place and my uh, source of inspiration. Um, and I have a special place uh, near Teno in the mountain as well. And it can be found in one of the Sami Game Jam games called, it's called Lost Memories and it's a virtual reality. So anyone can visit, visit my happy place. Hello. The Honda 
So my uh, body of water that sort of connects me to home is the Ottawa River, which is the river that runs right along the bottom half of my territory of Gunnisadaga. And I have a lot of really fond memories of it. Like even now when I return to my community, because I'm currently living in Montreal, which is like an hour away from my home territory. Like part, one of the first things that signifies me being home is like coming over this uh, hill called La Trap. And like you pretty much come over the hill and then you see like all the farmland spread out beneath it and then the Ottawa River running along the bottom of it. And it's just beautiful. And I have, you know, lots of memories of me biking along the river and being an angsty teenager sitting on the beach on a rock somewhere, looking at myself in the water. <laughs> so yeah, that's that's my body of water. Amazing. Yeah. And um, I'll say very briefly, uh, my body of water is Kua Pa, which is in Mauna Lua on Oahu. Um, my family's been off and on in that uh, large fish pond for about 150 years. And so uh, we used to be uh, fish, fish shrine caretakers. And so now we're getting, uh, yeah, I always had a relationship with that place and it's getting stronger day in and day out with all the work and communal engagement that um, ins is inspired by the work that all of you do too. Yeah. Um, so I guess the next question then will be a pretty good one. Uh, how do you develop indigenous developers? Um, Oudi, would you be willing to start on this one? Uh, sure. Um, I think I'm going to reflect a bit of why I did start doing this in the first place, um, because these two things are connected. Um, I think um, the main reason I started doing uh, or developing indigenous developers, because I didn't see me being reflected in gaming. Um, and I'm not talking about uh, seeing me as an image in, in games, um, I don't think that even would be necessary for me to see myself uh, in games that way, but um, this is more complex. Uh, but I think it has something to do with my generation being between assimilation and revitalization of our uh, indigenous Sami. Um, as I grew up, I realized that uh, we are the generation carrying the assimilation results, uh, leading imperfect or missing language or shattered cultural uh, knowledge. Um, the generation after us is often celebrated as breaking barriers or boundaries or making new innovations in art or music. But uh, my generation sometimes feels that we are we are missing the missing generation because people carry the stigma of being imperfect to present cultural heritage. Um, so I'm doing this for empowerment and self-expression to those who are missing to show that everyone can be a cultural carrier. Uh, the first Sami Game Jam was about finding this, this voice. So this is what I'm doing. It's for me, but it is for my generation as well. Mahalo for sharing that. Uh, that's a very powerful uh, way to drive the work that you do and connect with community and to develop Indigenous developers. Um, Kahanda Walks, would you be willing to share a little bit? Yeah, so uh, just like I said earlier, I, I'm the Skins Workshop Associate Director for Abtec and IF. And the way that I specifically develop Indigenous developers is we organize these workshops that uh, teach Indigenous youth, young adults to make video games, make machinima, which is like a film made in a virtual environment, if you don't know and uh, the seventh generation design workshops that it's pretty much giving indigenous people the tools to like tell our own stories. And we also try to encourage them or us to um, 
envision our futures that are rooted in our histories and in our traditions. So uh, yeah, that's that's kind of what I do. <laughs> oh, and a fun fact also was that I was one of the first participants of the first Skins workshop. I almost forgot to mention that. So like way back in 2008, when uh, Abtech and IF came to my high school with their very first video games workshop, I was one of the first participants. And now I've gone from like being a participant to an instructor at one of these workshops. And now I'm like in charge of organizing and delivering them. So I've got all kinds of experience in this field. <laughs> and now I'm done. Amazing. Mahalo gahandala. Alan? Um, so I, I guess um, in terms of developing indigenous developers, I'm kind of all over the place. Um, prime, I think my primarily my primary way of going about it has been to create content and get it out in front of people and see what conversations those inspire. Um, but in addition, in addition to that, it's you know been going around talking, um, doing um, workshops where I show people how they can get access um, to stuff, and then also and and that's but that's kind of speaking more to people who already have some technical know how. Um, but there's also been times where I've, I've gone out and um, especially with like the Indigenous Comic Convention where I've gone to um, Native communities and we've done game jams just to get them to talk about how do we create play centered around um, traditional ideas or language or food sovereignty or you know any, any of those kind of things. And uh, with, with with the overall goal, um, getting people is getting people to, to establish an um, an ongoing relationship. You know, an active participatory relationship with with their culture, um, and with their language, and with the struggles that they're going through, and also um, getting people in, um, into a place where they recognize that, you know, games games have been around forever. Um, the, the 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 advent of video games is still kind of relatively nascent. So there we're in we're in a, a position where it's getting easier and easier for people to to, to jump in and start creating right. But we have we still have the problem that the the same old um, stories that have that, that that have kind of populated all the other technical technically based media um, are are you know there in games as well. But because games is still kind of young, the faster we get other people um, access uh, access to it, and the faster we get them understanding that we can that that they they have stories to tell and they have voices that will resonate somehow with the technology. The sooner we start to get more of those voices and, and all these other stories and present um, a, an, an altogether different world um, to everybody um, that includes all of these various indigenous ideas and beliefs and, and structures. Mahalo for sharing. Uh, one one suture, I guess, with all of these uh, concepts that, he, that you've all brought up with how you develop indigenous developers is that you everybody is centered around working with community and centered around working in um, finding ways to think through the future and feel through the future by rooting our by being rooted in stories, and so um, that's a really good tie in to the next question, which is uh, what drives the work that you do uh, with community. Would you be willing to start with that, Alan? I keep reaching to find my mic button. <laughs> it's like my my Zoom brain kicks in. Um, what what inspires my my work? Um, well, I, I guess there's lots of things that kind of got me to this place because it's it's a place I didn't set out to be in. Um, um, I was a youth worker in the native community f in Chicago here for like ages, um, throughout through through the, the 90s, uh, early 80s into the 90s. Um, and as I was working with the kids that here in uh, in our community, I recognized very quickly a number of things that I thought um, needed addressing. One of them was just that when it came to um, storytelling media, um, they were the even though they had elders and people within their community who would who would tell stories and um, and engage them with 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 um, you know all kinds of fantasies and fantasies and whatnot. None of that stuff seemed real to them in a way that the stuff that they were seeing on TV and what they were seeing at the movies were. 
And so I wanted to, as, as I started to try to engage them with, with things and realize that they, they didn't actually have a working knowledge of so much. Um, I wanted to create a space that allowed the, the kids to start to play with, with again, play with their culture and, and understand. Um, and because in Chicago, we have such so many overlapping cultures, right? We've got, you know, we're, we're one of the landing zones for a relocation. So we've got lots and lots of tribes here. And that, you know, that makes for a lot of interesting um, um, politics, <laughs> to say the least. Um, but but it, it makes for a lot of interesting um, intersectional problems that, that show up. And, and um, so, so there, there's that piece of it. There's a piece of uh, myself as, as a kid who grew up in um, an abuse space um, and, and, and tangential to that abuse space, there was, you know, lots of, there was alcohol and drugs in, in um, surrounding. And I know that a lot of the kids that I was serving at the time had similar, similar problems. And it's so easy to kind of get stuck in this mindset that, that your definition is, is the, um, the, the, the pains and wounds and, and the victim spaces that, that you've been um, uh, oppressed into. And I wanted to try to give experiences where people felt heroic, where they, where they could see themselves being something more than, um, you know, just, just another native or just another black kid. Um, and then as I got deeper into it, I found bits of myself in the process. And um, as, as those bits of myself um, started to kind of turn into to, to medicine for my own um, healing of, of various wounds and whatnot, um, I felt the urge to find ways to um, make that tangible and give and give it to other people and, sh and share it, but in ways that didn't kind of um, lock it in, in these kind of historically fetishized spaces. So like I, I I'm not going to be the person who who comes in and and you know teaches you beat work. Though so, you know I can I can do some beat work. <clears throat> um, I'm not going to be the person who does pottery or any of that stuff. But yeah, I can do these things. But when it comes to to these these more um, playful spaces, that's 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 where um, I feel like my energy kind of sits and resonates. And that's you know that's so that's how it comes out. Mahalo, thank you. Oedi, would you be willing to share what drives you the work you do? Um, this is a tough one. <laughs> I have so many things uh, inspiring me and my work. I like mom, for example, and the rest of the <laughs> family and, and ancestors and the connections between me and my past and also with the future. And I say this uh, as an ongoing discussion between these things. But um, I think when I started doing this, the most inspiring uh, people I found from the uh, indigenous game developers community and following the group that what amazing things people already do globally, it was um, easier for me to take these steps towards this um, empowering in, in the field where actually has taken a very little steps so far. So, um, and then when the first Sami Game Jam happened, um, it was so powerful an event that um, I was of course very tired after that, but uh, I knew instantly after the event that this is the way to go of course we have to reflect and do things uh, differently or better next time but we need to do them that it was the right way to go because the people i met and talked with they said that they found it so um um elaborating and, and somehow unbreaking these uh, taboos or uh, it was a place for inner discussion. We, we were lacking the platform of discussing this uh, generational trauma and we unpacked it in five days during Sami Game Jam with, uh, uh, through discussions with what we had. Um, it was a place to say things out loud, and I think our steps were uh, lighter when we left the event. So I I knew that this is the way to do it again. People were uh, experiencing it uh, so 
uh, safe space. So it was, it still is the power of what drives me forward that I think this is needed and there is no one else to do it at the moment. So, so as long as there is no one else to do it, I'm going to do it. Mahalo. Thank you. Um, and right before we get to go on the walks, uh, there's a question that we'll follow up after she ans answers the uh, what drives her work. Yeah, and we see it in the, so please don't be afraid to ask questions. Uh, drop them in the chat or in the Q&A. Uh, go on the walks, you're up first. Yeah, so it's like almost hard to answer that kind of a question because, you know, there's so many different things that motivate me, like to, both professionally and personally. But like recently, what's really been inspiring me to do this kind of work, other than like looking back on my whole journey through like being the participant instructor to like the associate director of the workshops, is like a lot of people, not just indigenous or BIPOC people are feeling like unsatisfied with society and the way like these power structures are affecting all of us. Everyone's depressed, everyone's feeling overwhelmed. And like, to me, the answers are with indigenous people because a lot of us like before capitalism before white supremacy like before colonization a lot of us had figured out like how to live communally like and we all had social responsibility we all had like safety and we were provided for and we lived like fulfilling lives and it almost feels like boom we figured it out and then colonization happened and then like we took a million steps backwards like you know progress wise and now everyone else is starting to realize what indigenous communities have known for such a long time. And like, they're looking for leadership. They're looking for like, how can we possibly have a society that isn't like abusive to most of its, you know, citizens or participants or whatever you want to call them. And those answers for me are with indigenous communities. Cause like we've done it before and we can do it again. You just got to let us take the reins. So that's, like a part of a big part of what is motivating me these days. And, you know, I'm trying to, in doing all of this work with the workshops, like I'm trying to get the youth to realize that too, because when I was younger, I was like, oh yeah, there isn't really that much of a bright future for me because everywhere I turn, it's like, yeah, we had this great civilization and society that like got wrecked with colonization but uh, yeah, we haven't, we're still recovering from that. And like, for me that as a youth, I was like, great. So our glory days, like we peaked back then and it's all downhill, <laughs> but that's not the case. Like our answers are in our traditions, in our history and in our culture. And if we just reconnect with that, we can share all that, you know, bounty with the rest of the world. Cause like there's indigenous people all over the world and we all have solutions for all of these problems it's just a matter of like realizing it ourselves and then convincing everybody else like look guys we've done it before we can do it again let us help <laughs> so yeah that's that's what motivates me yeah mahalo to all of you for sharing that uh, thank you for sharing these uh, very brilliant things or what drives you to do the work that you do I think they're pretty well connected or pretty intimately connected to um, one of the first questions, which is uh, what message or lesson would each of you like for us to take away from today and pass on? Uh, I think I'll leave it open to anybody who wants to answer first, or if you want to answer that question directly. So I, I, I can start on that question because um, I think my answer kind of plays off of what Kent Wax was, was just saying. That you know, there's. I think a lot of our, our younger folks um, get that that impression that all of our awesome stuff happened way back when, right? And and we're often all all being taught that um, you know we didn't have anything, um, that we didn't have any technology, um, we didn't have we didn't have we, we didn't have a whole lot, and we were just kind of waiting for you know Europe to descend on us and <laughs> do all the things. But in reality, we 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 had tons, and we 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 were all peoples that use the um we had a relationship with the environment around us and as new things came into our ecologies we found uses for those new things you know to to um to the point 
that, that we, in many cases we were able, able to embrace them and turn them into our interpretation of, of those things. And um, I think it's a shame that so often people um, get in the mindset of our um, our um, our great existence happened way back then, and now we're just kind of you know shadows. And I don't want us to be that. I want to inspire people to, to realize that we're still making stories. Um, we're we're still dreaming the world as as, as we move forward. And so all of the things that are, that are coming in, into into our current ecologies are just tools that we can still use. Um, to help craft what needs to happen, there are there are there's this great wisdom that sits um, in the past that we can we can pull from, but there are also new wisdoms that are they're living inside the minds of our youth who who have knowings about the now, right? So finding ways to take that old stuff, and 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 also understanding the perspectives of what's going on in the world right now, and and making new stories, making new medicines, and finding um, new ways to help drive everybody forward. I think. That's, I think that's the, the biggest thing I want people to walk away from, uh, the biggest idea I want people to walk away from this with. Would others be interested in talking about that or wanna do another question? No. Yeah, I can say a little bit more about it. It's like, you know, everything that I said previously, like the, if there's one thing that I hope participants or anybody walks away from workshops with like, you know, drilled into their heads, it's that like, we're not people of the past. We're like living in the present. Our ancestors were like scientists and astronomers and like storytellers and artists. It's not like we were just, you know, running around in the nude, not doing anything, waiting to be colonized. That's, there's been a narrative that has been pushed and that is completely false. And like, I think a lot of us have internalized that, but you just have to reframe how you think about your history and your traditions and like connect yourself to the grander timeline or scheme of things. Because, you know, I think a lot of us feel like, what can I do with my one lifespan? Like, sure, it seems like, what can you really do if you only think of yourself as one indigenous person? But like you're connected to this bigger timeline of like all of your ancestors and all the generations that are going to come after you. So like even if you personally don't see the like fruits of your labor in your lifetime, like a, a future generation is going to feel it just the way that like we are feeling the benefits of the fights that our ancestors fought before. So like it's a bigger timeline. You're not just one little isolated indigenous person you're like connected to all of these different things that like transcend all of that so yeah <laughs> that's my spiel thank you uh, Odi, do you have ideas or thoughts about this i think i have nothing to add <laughs> alan i'm going to watch. really said it all okay um, I think I'll try and connect uh, two of the questions that follow up, which are, um, well, the first question is what excites you right now about indigenous game development? And the second one is what successes, activities would you like to see get more widespread recognition? And I think a good way to kind of connect these two ideas and questions is to think through um, what excites you about the successes and activities that, uh, and how would you like to see those things widespread in indigenous game development? Is that a good kind of, should I restate that question? Good, okay. Uh, I'll leave it open again, whoever would like to go first. Well, um, I think what excites me the most is, so when, when I got started, um, and again, I was just kind of meandering um, through figuring things out as I went. There, there weren't a lot of people that I could I could turn to and talk to about the things I was doing. And sometimes when I did, especially within both my native communities and my black communities, people would look at me like I was a crazy man. <laughs> um, and you know, fast forward how many years? Like thirty years. And excuse me, but there's so many people out there doing stuff now. There, you know, there, there's, there have been just, just since I got, I, I published Edrigor, there have been um, generations of developers 
who've come out and gotten more and more access and doing more and more things. And they're all over the place, right? It's the tabletop, they're in social spaces, they're in video game spaces. Um, and what's, what's, and I think the, the bigger success there is that is I think when most people think back to native video game type things, um, they immediately start thinking about things like never alone and other type, um, um, opportunities that popped up, but many of those were opportunities that were created, um, by, um, non-natives where they brought natives in to help them do a thing that they wanted to do. Um, and they ultimately were the ones who benefited more than, than the natives did. And, and again, um, since then, other groups have, have found ways to get funding. Um, they've started uh, making their own um, 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 game development companies. Um, we've got skins running, um, doing all the awesome stuff they do up there. Um, yeah, there, there, there's, there, there's this plethora of opportunities for um, in, um, in just indigenous peoples all over that, you know, if, if you want to do this kind of work, all you have to do is, is start doing the research and start connecting with people and um, and just start doing it right. There's um, the, the 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 tools have been so democratized that um, I can just give you a, a, a box of tools and say here, start making <laughs> and 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 you, you might be it might be ugly, but you're making right. And, and people are creating and and I can't wait to see the world ten years from now when when it's much more of a norm. Odi, would you want to talk about this? Yeah, I think I hmm, want to lift up uh, game jamming because we in this side of the world, as uh, Sami people, have very little um, gaming or game related events going on. And the Sami game jam was the first. So, what I want to do is to connect Sami people to uh, indigenous game developers globally and maybe develop the game jam towards this uh, uh, indigenous game jamming that moves on like uh, nomad people usually do. It goes around the world. So I would say that I want to see it blooming in in the next 10 years uh, as a platform for for people to meet other people who are indigenous and who are interested in games so that we can actually see to the future and reflect that we are alike with other people and and that we are good as we are we are not fractions of a culture but we are cultural carriers so that's the one I'm going to lift up. Go on, Dorks. Yeah. Um, the biggest thing that kind of excites me about the work is, you know, it's, I've recently kind of started thinking about the stuff that I do is like digital mutual aid like where we're sharing our curriculums or like sharing these tools. And oftentimes like the people I meet in these spaces, they're like so willing to share and like to take care of each other and uplift each other because, you know, we all want to see more indigenous games, more representation. And like, it's just so inspiring to me to see all of us working together, lifting each other up and like, I haven't really seen any like gatekeeping, like everything is just so out in the open. And yeah, I wish that would be something that just spreads across the world, across all different types of sectors. Cause like, you know, that's the way we gotta go. <laughs> yeah, these are all such amazing ideas and uh, concepts that are extremely valuable to really the world. And um, I am trying to think of a way to summarize it. And the only way I could like process all of this, like really great information and really great uh, ideas is to think of a word in Olelo Hawaii in Hawaiian language is called Lahui. Um, and Lahui means nationhood, but it also means to stop something or prevent something from happening. And so um, Lahui can also be like a group as small as three or more people, which is us right now. 
And so um, when we think about, uh, in particular, like developing games or developing, for me, like developing Lockweed, developing that space uh, in solidarity, in mutual aid, whether it's digital, where we're making this connection pretty much across the globe, um, we really do create space for sovereignty. And when we start thinking through and processing these things together in solidarity with each other, it, it makes it more um, plausible or possible for us to get land back, uh, to get uh, these really intimate relationships with each other that we thought we didn't have, but we do have. And so it's really exciting to hear all the things that you are, are bleh, remix, you are all working on. Yeah, and um, yeah, I'm really grateful for the conversation and the direction that is going right now. Um, I think one of the, well, um, if you haven't already, uh, please find a way to reach out or if we can try to drop our uh, way to contact us in the chat. Uh, that's one of the questions from Rhonda Moore. Um, but while we're doing that, uh, uh, one of the final questions I, I think from our side is, um, how do we engage futures and past? Um, and I think I'd like to start with Gahanda Wax, if that's okay. So for me, engaging the past, you can like do that through stories, you can do it through ceremony, and like it's really rooting yourself in these things, but also specifically to places, because like rooting yourself with a specific territory, you know, that gives you access to land-based knowledge and the legends pertaining to that area. And I think that's just what uh, we're lacking is that nobody has any relationships to the land they're living on anymore. It's just, you know, where we're, this is where I live. This is where I sleep at night. And then I go to work in the city and then I come back to my house in the suburbs and I'm just a little worker bee, but there's no real sense of community. So yeah, I've, you know, I've just gone off on a tangent. I'm kind of forgot what the original question was, <laughs> but yeah. Could you repeat the question? <laughs> yeah, I was about to. <laughs> uh, so how do you engage futures and past in the work you do? So I guess I can like pick up where I left off. Engaging the past, you know, connect with your history, connect with your legends and stories and like, you know, what am I trying to say? The, the lessons in those histories in the stories in all of that kind of thing, they're relevant today and they can be used today and applied in contemporary contexts. And if we do that, then, you know, we're gonna find so many solutions to all of the problems or most of the problems we're facing today. And that's, you know, a big part of how we connect our past with not only the present, but with our future, all the stuff that's yet to come. It's like, you know, just keeping the ball rolling. Like we just gotta keep doing the work and then one day, eventually, for one of our future generations, it's gonna be great. <laughs> and it doesn't really matter all that much to me if I'm not there physically, personally, as an individual. Like, as long as some indigenous person is living their best life in the future, then I'll feel like, you know, I've done my part and I lived my life and I did what I was supposed to do for my people and for the future generations. So that that's how I that's how I do it and think of it. Odi, are you willing to talk about this a little bit? Yeah, um, my link to the future and the past is intangible heritage. Um, I love the idea of intangible heritage being like this uh, space where all my creative work comes. It's uh, rooted in the past, but the nature of intangible heritage is that I take something out, add something and put it back so that the next person can or cannot, if wants to, can, can use what I have done and it moves forward. It's future oriented. It lives in this time and it is not about this uh, 
museum culture of being somewhere in the past, it lives where we are through who we are. And I like it as this iterative um, environment of creativity. So that's the connection. I like to nurture it and uh, uplift it more. So um, there's not a whole lot much more to add. Um, these ladies said said all the awesome stuff. <laughs> um, but I, I would I would um, I guess my my addition would be that for me um, my any in, in the future stuff that I do is built on structures that came from that came before, right? And so part of part of it is also reaching into what has gone before. And seeing what can be repurposed and find new ways and new new spaces as as we move forward, um, that's that's kind of like my 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 grandmother spider connection, right? Unraveling the web so we so we can um, build a new and cleaner web on on a regular basis. So an, an example of that to me is um, like in 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 my my role playing game, there is a a structure for for building character uh, for building player characters, and that structure is pulled from. Um, um, the, the 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 winter counts, which which was a structure for um, you know keeping track keeping track of how um, you know how people lived and how we survived and and moved from from year to year and generation to generation. Um, but but it's also a place where we kind of kept our stories. And if if um, if if that winter count kind of represents our culture as an entity and is and is just kind of jam packed with stories, then every time we make character, all of our characters should also be equally jam packed with stories. And by by connecting those stories. By ruining ourselves and what has gone before, and creating opportunities for what's going to happen in front of us, so it so it becomes about um, owning the space that we're in right now, and then using using the the, the anchors that we have um, to 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 give us like the, this rooting that lets us open the way for those who are going to come come after us. So it becomes it's not quite a leapfrog, but it's definitely a it's like waves coming up on the shore, right? And and we 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 slowly um, you know, we, we 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 slowly have have this effect, um, and 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 I think can I can I also kind of glue this with one of the questions that's already in in the uh, in the chat. Um, there's a question about accessibility, and um, I think this is also something we we have to think about as as we're we're figuring out how to grab all the stuff from before, um, bring it into now, and then make room for stuff that comes in the future. Is that not everybody has access to everything? So again, um, and thinking in terms of like how do we um, democratize tools, how do we um, democratize spaces, how do we identify spaces, how do we build boundaries that allow for as many people to get as that, get access to the stuff, and then and then also recognizing that we're in the global world. So if, if we're making things that are accessible to everybody, what what is it that we create for our own um, that also will ripple out and affect the rest of the world? Because you know that that um, we always have to be thinking ecologically. So if we if we make something out there, put something out there, it ripples out, it affects others, and those others will ripple back again like waves, right? Those bounces and it comes back, and so that's going to come back to us. So nothing we do exists in a vacuum. Um, it's all about building bits and pieces. It's all about the bits, all, all about the things that come together. So um, and thinking that way, remembering that um, in terms of accessibility. Um, technology isn't just our computers, right? Our 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 stories are our technology. Our languages are our technology. Um, and if if you're in a space where you don't necessarily have full physical access to um, you know a lot of the digital stuff, you can still be making in you know what we call analog ways or, or tangible and, and tactile ways. Um, and 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 in addition to that. We can be reaching out to folks and, sh and showing them how to build their own structures from the ground up. So it's not it's not just you know building um, you know our cultural structures, but you know the programmatic stru structures that we use to actually create spaces. Because when you think about it, when it comes down to video games, this, this is this is programming, and that programming is language. And so we're we're literally using words to create realities, right? So. Um, finding if, if 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 the existing structures aren't accessible to the people who are there, then we need to show them ways to actually build build new structures up from the ground up, and alternatively alternatively find um, structures that are not as um, um, rooted in monetization methods that 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 restrict things. 
so like for for example um um, I know a lot, a lot of groups like to use, I mean, a lot of the, a lot of the, the, the game engines out there right now, um, dial home all the time. They require you to always be online uh, to be able to do anything. But when you're living in places where you don't have internet access, that's, that's not something that, that's available. So for, um, figuring, finding engines that, that, that don't do that and, and making them, you know, putting like engine kits together for groups and saying, here, take this stuff and, and build it out finding things that give people access to um, the source code so that they can build up their own version of it. So they're not wanting to, they're not, they don't have to deal with, you know, any of the capital, I want to say capitalization, but um, any, any of the other restrictions from, from the, the other, other owners or any of the physical restrictions because of lack, lack of, um, of, you know, wires and whatnot. Um, I mean, I think it's, it's worth it for us to consider, is there a way to, to, you know, to physically give these things to people so that they can grow their own. It's like seeds. Right. If I if I give you a seed ball <laughs> filled with a bunch of heirloom, heirloom seed, seeds for my people, you're going to take it and you're going to uh, find the right land for it. You're going to find the right water for it, and you're going to build something up. These are all such great ways to think through and process through um, accessibility and working with. Um, community and rooting ourselves in past and future while also being very present with what's going on in the world right? and like tangibly making moves towards uh, giving access to different spaces. And it seems like one of the things that um, all of your work does is intentionally move through cosmogonies of relationships and like finding a way to uh, see the specific connections that exist in the universe and in the world and from where we are and finding ways to bridge uh, potential gaps by like like you've been saying uh, alan and gohan the walks and and woody um, finding a way to make the what seems unintelligible like a like an idea like an ancestral past that sometimes seems so distant that we can't connect to it but making sure that we have that root um, in all the work that we do when we're driven towards the future or we're, when we're driving the future. Um, and so the aesthetics and the conversations that you've all been having and have all brought up really do centralize what, well, from my perspective, and please correct me if I'm overstepping, um, having relationships with our technologies, not necessarily like digital technologies only. So like our technologies of relationships, of language, of access, and making sure that it's um, not ethical, but uh, ensures that it's sustainable uh, beyond what we think our ethics are today. And in order near the end, um, would does anybody have uh, any closing remarks that they'd like to bring up for uh, participants or viewers? So, sorry, I was just struggling to find my unmute button for a second. But uh, my my clo closing remarks would be like, whether you're an indigenous person who's like already connected with your history and your culture and your like places and territories or not, like I encourage you to go even farther into that work, just like lean into it. Because like that is where you're gonna find all the fulfillment, you know, that you, you've been looking for basically. Cause like, if any of you guys have had experiences like me, like you've gone looking literally everywhere else for like, you know, my job to do art as a graphic designer out there as just somebody grinding out video games for whatever company. And, you know, I, I tried the corporate world and it sucked and I hated it. So like your answers are with your people. You just might have to do a little bit of extra work to to set the foundation because you know we're kind of just getting going on this and it's getting bigger and bigger all the time. So yeah, just come on in. The water's fine. <laughs> um, I think my closing would just be that remember that creation isn't something that ha happened way back when. Creation is an ongoing process. Um, and we live in a world that really works hard to kind of 
to kind of stick us into these like hierarchical structures of like you know that there are very much power driven structures of who's who, who's who's most important who's disposable um but a lot of what we have done in the past um comes from m more relational structures right where where it's 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 people stepping up to do what they can do and then passing the torch when they need to pass the torch on onto other people um so as you consider getting out there and in, and engaging with this kind of work build a support circle that um that is devoid of as much hierarchical thinking as you can and much more about relational you know you know who, who are your aunties and uncles that you, that you can that you can pull together to, to help you um, move forward um and i i say that both you know in a direct heritage kind of way but also in terms of people you're reaching out to um for uh, to be mentors to you um, to, uh, to, to help you um, do things and people who are going to be helpers. Um, one of the things that I do in my um, my summer program with the, the, the kids that I have is is early on get them talking about old old stories and then have a big conversation about you know there's no kings or queens um, in, in, in these spaces. there's no princesses, there's none of that stuff. All we have are creators. And if we all uh, if, if we all if we only have creators, that means everybody brings some knowing to the space. And if you if you have knowing and your creator, then then all all we can do is just start you know weaving our thread together to figure out what it is that we can make that that benefits and nourishes us, and then kind of cascades out to those around us. So get to making and get to sharing. Can I add here that I'm honored to have shared this panel with you guys. You are so talented and I am so inspired by your work and I hope that the audience feels it too. <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody, um, for sharing this space with us. And these amazing panelists, uh, Alan, Gahanda Wax, and Oudi, have been amazing and continue to do amazing work with community. And we're really grateful for all of you to coming in and sharing space with us. But yeah, really thank you to our panelists for all the brilliant work that you do. Um, yeah, keep keep killing it. <laughs> Um, I'll stay on for a little bit. <laughs> I think I'll drop, um, I'm going to drop my contact information if anybody else wants to drop theirs. I'm going to put my, ooh, I didn't mean, mean to go live. <laughs> um, my email is here. You know, you know what, while we're still here, I do want to encourage people. Um, like, I think a lot of us get into the space where we, are, we try to work with individuals on a regular basis. And we forget that there are people whose job it is to work with lots of individuals on a regular basis. So if you have these big skills, it's good to reach out to teachers. Teach teachers how to teach the things that are uh, affecting the, the, the youth in our spaces. On our, um, teach them how to you know, pull this stuff together. That, that way we, we reach a much bigger audience. Thank you, everybody. Great job, panel. Amazing work. Keep doing the work you do. The Honda Walks, I want to come visit you.
<laughs> I want you to come visit. <laughs> <laughs> or you guys can come here, come yeah. to my house. <laughs> yeah. As soon as, uh, you know, travel restrictions yeah. ease up a bit. Yeah. Yeah, I'll definitely either be coming down or hopefully you'll be coming up. Maybe we'll cross paths at Imaginative again one day. <laughs> oh yeah, that would be amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I I'm gonna leave because I'm gonna okay. go eat some lunch. <laughs> Are we still live? Sounds good. I think so, but I think we should leave. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Kavanadi. <laughs>